Commander going at 61 degrees in my house and it's only 25 minutes to six. So, anyway, thank you for coming. Uh, thank you, Deeds, for allowing us to, to come and, and do these educational seminars. Uh, we do a lot of them next week. If you happen to be in Rancho Mirapia, California, at Western States Horse Expo, Thursday and Friday, I have thoughts. Uh, but what we're going to talk about today is suggestive health, and then we're going to flip right into feeding the foot. Uh, that scared me. Cool. So, I, I, I'm a retired youth professor, so we always talk about most of our discussion topics. We're going to talk about the digestive system. We're going to talk a little bit about equine gastric ulcers, uh, some large gut problems, and some good management practices. I put this up not to, not to, we're not going to belabor the point or anything, but I want you to see how all this stuff is shoved in this horse. And when you really get to looking at it, you understand why when we have to do colic surgery, it costs so much, because stuff is trying to come out and we're trying to get stuff back in. And this is one of the reasons that horses have some problems it is just because of the way it's designed. The first thing here is the stomach, and then this is the cecum, and this, is, this would be similar to this rumen in this cap. So where these forages are digested changes Horses is ingested in the cow here, back here in the horse. So the horse is kind of milk built backwards. You know, I know God was much more smart than I am, but he made a mistake there. He should have done a little more flipping or something. <laughs> the first part of the digestive system is the mouth, and there was a really good talk yesterday afternoon on equine dentistry. Hopefully you have a good dentist, someone that does it routinely, not three times a year. Uh, the guy that I use is not a DVM, but he does hundreds and hundreds of horses a year. Yeah, so I, I, and, and he does all hand tools. He doesn't do the power tools. Uh, power tools, if they don't know what they're doing, things happen too quickly. Anyway, so what we have to do is we have to be careful about at least once a year have, have your good decline dentist check your horses teeth because this starts the whole digestive process. And horses chew like this, they grind, they go sideways. People chew like this and this and all kinds. And if you don't believe it, go to the cafe at dinner time of the day and watch people eat. <laughs> you can see every kind of chewing that there is. Horses don't, they chew in a rotation motion. So what we do is we get these edges on our molars that can lacerate the cheek and everything else. So we need to come in and what's the term that we use? Floating. We float the teeth. We try and get that dental arcade, those molars, back to where they're level. Because remember, that horse is going to chew and grind, and he's got to break that forage up. He's got to break those stems and those leaves. He needs to break those down, and I'm going to show you those kind of things. Then at times, we'll get caps on horses, and we have to go in and pull these caps off. So have a great dentist. There's three people in your horse's life that you need to have on your phone. One of them is speed dial, unless you've got an error. Speed dial. Know him. Have a great relationship with him. Make sure you pay your bills. The second one is if you find a great farrier, and I'll talk a little bit more about that when we get to the foot problem. If you find a great farrier, keep him. And the guy I have, we did, we did feet Wednesday. I never know when we were supposed to do my horse's feet. He does. And I hand him a check before he leaves. He's that good. He does some of the top cow horses and cutting horses in the world. And this is critical. Start them as babies and come on through. This is, this is my wife's old gilded, uh, a place we had in Utah. And this lady did tons and tons of horses all over the time. And you can notice he's a little bit happy. <laughs> anyway. You can do it either way. The next part, so between the mouth and, and the stomach is this big old long thing called the esophagus. And the esophagus in the horse is kind of unique in that horses can't regurgitate. Horses can't hurl. So what goes in only has one way out. Now, that's not to say that you won't see a horse vomit, but when you do, that's when that speed dial thing better come in handy. Because it means that that stomach is backed up. Probably. You know, digestive cannot go from there into the small intestine. 
So that's that's an emergency situation. Because the, the, there's not something called uh, reverse peristalsis. And that just means that muscles work in, in conjunction. And so it only goes one way, it can't come back up. And then I'll show you a picture of the stomach here in a minute. And that, that esophagus comes in in a very oblique angle. Not like you would think, it just comes in straight into the stomach. It comes in, kind of turns underneath itself. So the stomach is very small in this horse. And the way to think about it, it's about the size of a two gallon gas can. Okay? About that size, it's very small. In a 1,000, 1,200 pound horse, think how, how that is relative to that body size. And the reason is that horse is supposed to eat continuously. He was put on the earth, he went there and graze continuously. And given the opportunity, a horse will spend about 85% of daylight hours grazing. But what do we do? We put him in a stall feeding twice a day. We go, why don't we have digestive problems? And that's why. It produces hydrochloric acid. And this hydrochloric acid is critical for calcium and magnesium uh, uh, absorption. It's critical for proper protein digestion and absorption. And real quickly in a minute, talk about why we, when we shut down this proton pump or this, this acid, why we have some problems. This is important, especially in the older horse or horses that we have some calcium metabolism issues. And I'll hit that when we talk about omeprazole. The pH in this, if we get down into that lower stomach, is about the same pH as uh, 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 battery acid, hydrochloric acid. It's about one to two, very acidic. And its job is to also kill pathogens. It's to kill bugs and bacteria that try and get through the digestive tract. So what happens when we feel a, feed a probiotic? We'll answer that one in a minute. <coughs> so, equine gastric ulcer syndrome, uh, several years ago, this was the disease du jour. Everywhere I gave a talk, my horse had got ulcers. How do you know? Well, because my neighbor told me, his horse has ulcers, I know mine has them. My horse looks like his. Well, this is that that the pH here in this upper part, and this right here is not protected. It doesn't have a mucus mem uh, uh, type of secretion. This lower part, uh, this uh, the pyloric region has mucus that protects the gut wall itself. This upper part doesn't. Here's the esophagus coming in, and you can see it comes in kind of a weird angle. So the digestive comes in here first, pH is six, six and a half, not really acidic. By the time it gets down into here, we're at a pH of about two. So it becomes very acidic. This is that gas can I was telling you about. That's about the size of that stomach. So what happens is it becomes, it comes in and it can't get back out. This area right here in this blue circle is called the Margo Plaquette. This is where we see most of the ulcerations happening. This is the line between the non-protected and the protected. This area right here, we see very few ulcers. And the reason being, it has protection, it has a coating, it has peptobismol, for lack of a better way to think about it, around that part of the stomach. So this part, the acid doesn't hurt. This demarcation area in the blue circle, it hurts. This area up here, it hurts. See, if I knew what I was talking about. You can see, Margot Pichetis, you see these ulcerations. And they're graded on how deep they are, not how many they are. It's the depth, the amount of erosion. This is a nice, clean stomach right here in Margo Pichettis. We didn't see a problem here. We scoped these horses at the racetrack in California. We did these at Hollywood Park back when they ran Hollywood Park. So, 90 plus percent of the horses have ulcers at race. Standard reds, about 16% at rest have them. About 28% in training, about 64% in racing. Why they have less ulcers than flat track horses, we don't know. Why does this thoroughbred have more of a four horse than this? Interesting thing that, that no one can explain, why do trotters have twice as much ulceration than patients? The lower body condition score, the thinner that horse is, the more risk we have of ulcers. Keep that horse at about a five and a half to six and a half body condition score. Don't know how to do body condition score and learn. It's critical. About 60% of performance horses 
hunter jumpers, and here's the thing, it doesn't matter if it's hunter jumpers, cutting horses, rope horses, barrel horses, dressage horses, multiple days a week we work on competition along this stretch, right? We stress these horses. About half of the foals have ulcers. We've seen uh, horses and uh, foals in the first 30 days of life has, uh, have ulcers. Two things. One, a lot of stress. Two, what do foals spend a lot of time doing? Laying down. So if they lay down, that acid gets up in that non-protected area, right? One of the things about performance horses when a, in race horses, when a horse runs, what does he do? He draws up, right? Everything comes up. So what he's doing on that stomach, he's pushing that acid up to the non-protected area. So what's the cause and imbalance between the protection, that mucous membrane, that, that mucus, the, the slime that's produced, the peptobismol, versus aggressive, the acid. So if we've got a horse that is out chewing all the time, see, for example, horses don't have a Pavlovian response. That's like, how many people in here love cheesecake? Okay, think about the very best cheesecake you had in the last week. If you'll close your eyes and think about it, you'll salivate. That's a Pavlovian response. Dogs do it, we do it, horses don't do it. Horses don't salivate a lot unless they are chewing. So, and then they don't have to eat a lot, they just have to chew. That's why we try and keep something in front of them, keep them chewing most of the time. That is a protective part. We have, we have buffering compounds that come down into that stomach and buffer that acid. That's what they're supposed to do. That's nature. So what happens is we don't have that and we got more of this aggressive aspect, so we end up with ulcers. Stress, feed management, I'm only going to feed twice a day. I feed four times a day. One of the reasons I have one mare that her goal is like my little bulldog. The food has to leave. I got other horses that they'll eat and wander off and go and look at the cow pen or do this or do that. Maybe eat a little bit more. Insects, you know, butte, overuse of butte's a problem. Stay at that, whatever your vet tells you to use. Bacteria. We know in humans also is caused by helico, uh, helicobacter pylori. We find this bacteria in the stomach of horses, but it doesn't seem to be the cause. Science, chronic colic. Little bitty tummy ache all the time. Little nuisance tummy ache. Not that I'm going to lay down and I'm going to roll and flip and make my own freak out and make my daddy make me lead that stupid horse around for hours that we don't do anymore. Bless your heart. Poor doers, they don't like it because it hurt. Uh, we see this sometimes when behavioral changes. We'll see that horse that you put his feet in his feed bucket, he'll come up and take a big bite of it, and then he'll turn around and go to the back corner of his stall and he'll just stand there. His the ears come down, you know, and then after a bit, he'll come and take another bite and he'll leave again. But what happens is that feed gets down there and it, it irritates that ulcer and it hurts. And he's like, okay, that hurt. And he's like, oh, wait a minute, that's good. No, it hurt. That's good. So we see that on the court door, and we see that th this behavioral change. We see teeth grinding. We really see it in foals. That brook's called bruxism, where that foal just kind of gnashes his teeth together. You've seen that. Uh, especially when you start separating mares and babies. Uh, we see a decrease in body condition scoring and weight, primarily because of court doors, because they don't eat like they should. Management. Excess the forage as much as possible. I put this slide over here because you see that little child, he's slobbering. So what I want that horse to do is salivate. The more salivation I can get, the more I'm buffering that stomach acid. None of my starch intake for feeding. Never. Yesterday I said never use the word never. <laughs> this is a never kind. Never feed more than four pounds of concentrated sweet feed for feeding. Period. Ever. So yesterday, the average intake of grain at the racetracks is 15 pounds. They feed three to four pounds, three to four times a day. Don't feed more than four pounds of feed grain per day. That's not hay. Now this is grain. This is Doreen and your trainer, Jimmy's, John, whoever it is. Four pounds. Okay. 
And you can use some antacids. There's some things that we do use. You know, we use uh, 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 taking that and uh, uh, what's the other one? Renitidine and cimetidine are the, 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 the compound names. Things that you can do, use a slow feeder. Make that, give that horse a lot of time where he just pulls out a little bit. Remember, that all I need is a stem for him to chew. You don't have to chew a lot to get that salivation going. Use these slow feeders. You can do it as nets. There are a lot of different ways that you can do nets. Uh, I use these and I have a horse that knows how to tear the snot out of these in a hurry and he knows where that little hole is. <laughs> and he'll sit there and eat out of that little hole. Uh, put mats in your stalls. Mat every stall. I'm completely mad. If you use slow feeder nets, be sure and check your incisors periodically. They can, they can sure uh, rough up those gums. So, we know that all of these kind of things stress horses. That's neither one of my horses. So, what do we do? We, we do some compounds. We think pharmacy is a good thing in, in trying to do this, and it's correct as far as curing or treating or, or, or getting these ulcers taken care of. Sulfurphate is, is, is a compound that we feed in, it goes in, it finds that ulcer and it coats it. It will coat it. Histamine 2 receptors and thing is Zantac. Tagamet for two things. It takes a lot of that. Gets to be kind of expensive. The one most that most of us use are proton pump inhibitors. It's called GastroGuard. Is it the curative? Ulcer guard is a preventative. I use ulcer guard the day before I go to a cutting while I'm there and the day I get home. I don't continuously use it because it impacts magnesium, calcium, uh, protein, iron. It decreases absorption of those. But what this does is it shuts down this proton pump. The horse does not make acid. Shuts it off. So, the next thing we go into is a small intestine. It's a long tube, and it's about the size of a water hose. About like that. Primary sign of enzymatic digestion. This is where protein, fat, and fiber, or carbs, are, are digested and, and absorbed. Most of the vitamin and mineral absorption takes place. And it's not just a, not like at water hose, it's not just a, a, a tube. It has, in there, it has these little projectiles, and these are called villi. And on these villi are something called microvilli. And so we've got boot coop of surface area. So we absorb things. If it was just this, this water hose tube just smooth, you wouldn't have very much surface area. Think of your fist. How much surface area do I have here? Now how much do I have? And that's essentially what we have here in this, this uh, small gut. The large gut is where we get bacterial and protozoal digestion. Uh, this is where the fiber is digested. This is what makes that horse unique compared to us. We can go out there and graze all we want on that grass and we're not going to gain any weight. We don't have a big sequel. Some people here may not have one at all. If you have an appendectomy, you don't have a sequel. I literally did. We get foster conclusion. Here's where, in this area is where we make road outs. And if we don't get that water reabsorbed, we get cow plot type consistency or we get a diarrhea or something along those lines. Problems, and we'll talk a little bit about interlifts, impaction, and laminitis. This is about the size of a dryer vent. It's about that big. But it goes along and it hits this one spot where we get a transition and it goes down to a tube about that big. And then it opens back up. So if it's really dry and it, and, it, and, it, and it can't get through that, when it goes from that to that and then back out, that's where we get an impaction. Speed dial. <laughs> Got to get here. You know, there's some things you can try. A lot of times, if you put, what's the first thing a horse does when you put him on a trailer? He poops. Put him on a trailer. <laughs> you don't have to drive him. Just put him on a trailer. And a lot of times, you can resolve some of these things your own self. You know, the cecum is this big black brown pouch, and it looks kind of like a big garbage uh, can and, and, uh, bag, and it's on the right side of the horse. This is where we get the bacterial digestion. This is where he breaks down the cellulose and any cellulose that's in that grass or that hay. So this is extremely important for some horses that don't get, you know, that's what they get. Nothing for forages. 
They get all their energy from all the fatty acid production, which is critical. We get it a lot in our other horses. Horses do not require grain. I mean, somebody yesterday mentioned that to me. Horses don't have to have feed. You don't have to buy somebody's feed to keep them going. My horses get their butts worked off. They're cutting horses, they're shown, they're worked every day. I feed about a half pound of oats just for replacing uh, glycogen. That's it. If you've got a horse that you ride every 13th Thursday and he's a great yard ornament, unless there's some particular reason, good quality forage, I promise you, will keep him fat. In fact, too fat. He'll be obese, man. We've got metabolic problems, and that's the disease now, the disease de jure. What happens is if we overfeed that more than four pounds of grain or carbs, we start out, remember I showed you that pH was about six, five, six, six? Starts out here, but what happens is when it goes into the, from the, the, the uh, small intestine into the large intestine, those bacteria go, hey baby, I've got sugar. So what they do is they get to chewing on that and that pH starts dropping really quick. See how fast this comes in when you give them too much carbs? so that more bacteria, acid producing bacteria, they start to grow. And then what happens is the good guys in here start dying off and we end up with laminated episodes. It's a simple thing. Don't feed a lot of carbs at any given time. But you have to feed carbs if you have working horses. Feed companies, we've scared you to death to feed carbs. You have to feed them. You can't replace muscle glycogen with forages or with fats. <laughs> This just shows rotation of the coffin bone. Uh, normal hoof wall, you can see here, what happens is we've got tendons that are pulling down, and we've got the, the uh, sensitive and insensitive lamina that are starting to separate. This is a little different view of it. You can see here the separation that we've had and come down, short, the long pass and short pass and the navicular bone, the coffin bone. The bacteria I was telling you about in this large gut, these are these guys in here, they're starting to eat that fiber. And what, what happens is they will eat everything except the lignin, which is the really tough stuff. It's kind of like what trees are, are lignin, wood. And the only thing that digests that is termites. Horses don't have termites in the large gut. They do not, they can't get through the stomach. It kills all the termites. So, what happens is, one of the things, the, the largest immune organ in your body is your gut. Same thing on the horse. It gives us IgA. And it also does some other things. It stimulates immunity. These are all these bacteria in here. This is how important these little guys are. They stimulate the immune system. They change things into something that horse can utilize. They change that cellulose into volatile fatty acid. He can't use the cellulose, but he can use the volatile fatty acid. So they do that. They produce vitamins. B vitamins are produced in this horse's large gut. For a horse that's not used, that's kind of just kind of being a nice yard ornament, his gut's gonna supply enough B vitamins. You don't have to run out and buy a B vitamin pack. Uh, they, they, they also, there's a barrier in here. And, and the bacteria help keep that barrier effective. The good guys hang on to here so that the bad guys can't find somewhere to, to grab a hold of. So this is all the cool things that this, um, these bugs do to help your immune system. It's critical. I believe in probiotics. I use the heck out of them. Prebiotics and probiotics. I want to feed that good. Prebiotic, non-digestible food ingredients. Really what we do with prebiotics, we feed bugs. We don't feed the horse, we feed the bugs. And the bugs have to feed the horse because they convert them. They're beneficial, they feed beneficial bacteria. The two that we really see are called fructooligosaccharides and nanooligosaccharides. There's another long chain sugar called fructans that are bad. It's, it's, a, it's not a good thing. They stimulate mucosal uh, immunity, may improve insulin sensitivity in obese horses. So if you've got a metabolic horse or an eight or a nine body condition score, go back and look at some of these prebiotics. Probiotics are living organisms. They are not dead yeast. There's two types of yeast. One is killed. Most of the time you see yeast in pellets, they're dead. 
Most of these guys, if you get up 170, 70 degrees, 160 degrees, they're like, I can't do this. And I guarantee you, if they've been through an extruder at 260 degrees, they are dead. They, they kicked it back. They exert a benefit beyond nutritional value. Remember I just showed you all the stuff they did in that necrosal immunity aspect? <laughs> and here's the ones a lot of times you'll see, Enterococcospacium, uh, Lactobacillus acidophilus, Texii, Pantera. This is the one I like, it's Pediococcus acylactosis. This one will get through that acid that's trying to keep bacteria from getting in. Most of these guys, when they get in the stomach, <laughs> I'm dead. You had you too, I can't have one. So a lot of the things we feed really don't make it to where they need to be. Yeast culture, the two that I like, Gilardi and Cerevisia, they need to be live. When I look at a probiotic, I want to see some numbers. I want to be in the billions, not in the millions. Especially not in hundreds of thousands. 10 to the third, 10 to the fourth, that's background noise. I want to be 10 to the eighth, ninth, or tenth. This is acylactosy. This is some data that, that was done in Maryland. pH 6.2, this is acidophilus. They started out both, you know, pretty good numbers. pH of two, <laughs> these guys, they've given up the ghost. They're dead. There's nothing to the culture. Here, same thing. You notice it knocked those numbers down, but they're alive. Most of the probiotics that we feed do not colonize the gut of the horse. They don't stay there. If you quit feeding it after a given period of time, they're gone. I've not seen anybody who's ever colonized it. That's why we feed it during especially stressful times. Symbiotic is a prebiotic with a probiotic. And you can see that. I don't have enough time? No, you're halfway through. Oh, well, I'm not halfway through anyway. Good. I'm going. Landing. Landing. Uh, so what we do is we now we get uh, probiotics that, that are anti-inflammatory. We can get them that decrease the pathogen shedding. We know now that I can affect the gut and it affects the mind. That's a scary thing. The first time I saw where we affect reproduction, I'm going, yeah, I went to college. I know that that reproductive tract and that digestive tract are separate. I know there's something in between there. How did it do that? Well, it does. It change, it, 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 we get metabolites that change things. Probiotics, are the, uh, to me, are the antibiotics in this century. Especially since we're not in the list production, now, we can't feed anymore. Sand impaction is a big issue. Uh, we'll get a little bit of that. This right here is a mare that I was uh, familiar with in Utah. You see she had a little gravel in her, in her gut. She's put down. The people that owned this horse and they didn't own bicycles, not this horse. They had no idea anything about horses. You can see that this is, this is a regular graph that you can see sand in the gut. They still rise. We don't try and do this to the horses just to check for sand. That's really a little bit difficult to do. You can do a couple of things. This you can take manure. Don't let it get in the dirt. Take manure, put it in a water bucket, break it up, rinse down in the bucket, and you'll feel sand. You feel sand there it's in the gut. Uh, a lot of people have an aversion to touching manure. You need to learn that it's a great thing. And so, what you can do is, is go to your veterinarian, and they may have them even in here buy an OB sleeve, big old plastic sleeve comes up to about here that we use in palpation. Pick up your road apples, turn it wrong side out, you never touch the manure, add water to it, break up the manure, and you won't see it in the fingers because the manure makes it kind of dark looking or greenish or brownish looking, but you'll feel sand in the fingertips. You feel sand in the fingers, you're sand in the gut. And you can get it powdered. Or, it comes with powder, it comes with pellet. And the problem with powders is that as soon as this stuff gets wet, it becomes slimy. Anybody here familiar with uh, Metamucil? That's silly. That's all it is. Just don't use it on your horse, it's way expensive. Uh, but you can get it in crumbles or pellets. I use it this way. Uh, I don't use it here. I, I've had a guy say, well, that right there is. That, that doesn't break down in water. Well, it does once the horse chews it. Hopefully, he's got teeth and he chews. Remember, we talked about that. So, I use this as more convenient. My horses will eat it. I do it the first seven days of the month. 
because where I do it, I do it every day, divisible by three. Things that you can do to minimize sand ingestion, one is make sure that you keep your feeds up, you know, off the ground. Don't walk your feet on the dirt. If you feed them, and, and, and I don't know whether I've got a slide in here or not, I have a horse that's first go. When you put it in a hay feeder, is to get it out and get it down on the stall floor. Everything's mad. If he's going to do that, then he's going to leave. So I took the, took the feeders out, I just feed him in there on the stall floor. Man. Sandy patches, clean feeders of sandy dirt. Well, I feed, hey, it doesn't have any sand yet. Look in your feeder. You'll be amazed how much sand comes in with your hay. And things like bolts and dead rabbits and snakes and all kind of other stuff. Check your feeders. I've seen all of this. Feeding cuts, hay feeders, etc. Use mats where possible. Use selling products as directed. This is my place in Utah. And over time, I let this hay mat build up because there's no dirt here. Because you can't keep horses from moving them out of here. And I've had to mat it a huge area. Surprise didn't do that. Salt, salt intake horses need about two ounces of salt per day on average. I don't like blocks. Blocks are for cows. Horses have tongues like sand. Cows have tongues like sandpaper. Plus, what else is a cow going to do? I mean, you're going to saddle up a cow and go work horses? No, we don't want that one. So they, they, they can be bored. I use loose salt. In fact, I use a calcium phosphorus salt mineral mix. Uh, feed companies make them. Then on this, we talked about this a minute yesterday. We see this much more on the West Coast. It's more of a California issue. And everybody says it's because it's high in protein. No, it's not. It's because of phosphorus and magnesium, and the alfalfa hay that we have on the West Coast is very high in magnesium. And we get something, something called struvites. We see this in cats. We have, we have five indoor cats. My wife likes cats. She's that crazy cat woman. <laughs> I'm allergic to cats. <laughs> so we have one that has struvite. So what does he get? He gets prescription diet. That's a fortune. <laughs> Genetics of uh, uh, UC Davis, which is a vet school at Day in California. Uh, they do, do lots and lots of inner lift surgeries. Arabian is about 40 plus percent of the horses that had inner lifts in, uh, uh, at UC Davis were Arabians. 9% of the cases were siblings. So there's a genetic factor in there somewhere. We saw it more in mares than in gildings and stallions. One cup of vinegar to the feed, try it uh, physiologically. I can't make that work in my head. So you put clean foreign material. It's kind of like the way an oyster makes a pearl. It gets a little bitty nidus in there, you know, a little piece of sand or whatever. It starts building around it. And that's how this inner lift forms. I've got one in my desk that I picked up in one of my runs that a horse got in there, and it was about the size of a golf ball. They get up like that one, it's about like that. That doesn't pass through that little bitty tube I'm telling you about. College surgery, fats, and insurance. I'm an insurance agent, so they can do that. That just gives you an idea of what one would look like sitting in the large gap. Good management practices, feed at the same time. I said yesterday, we feed five noon, five and eight. And then I feed supplements at six. I feed an hour and a half, I feed eight and five. Feed off the ground. You can't mat it. Dental work is critical. Good dentist. Use epidemics. Follow your veterinarian's recommendation in your area. That's the worms. Okay. And which, we, which in, in the horse world, we call them worms. And, and I have a good friend who's a great parasitologist. He said, you mean you're putting worms in your horse? No, I'm getting rid of them. Well, then it's deworming, not worming. Anyway, remember, forage first. Forage first. This is what makes a horse man. different from a horse owner. They're observant. I sometimes go out there and will sit in a run with my horses and just sit there and watch them. Years ago, when I was in high school, I got home, I grew up on a ranch. I got to the house and I asked my mother, I said, where's daddy? And she said, oh, he's down in the pasture somewhere. I said, okay. So I took off and down in the pasture and, and I saw his truck underneath the big old hummock of oats. And I went up there and my daddy was up in years and, and uh, he's sitting on the tailgate of the pickup truck. With his feet 
just went out and I walked up behind him. What are you doing? So I'm listening to my cows eat grass. He was observant. Be observant. It's critical. You've got to know the normal for your horse. Don't worry about the normal for mine. I'll, I'll, I'll wrestle with mine. Be observant. Take our message. Majestic health is an ongoing process. Both mental and physiological. That mental part is really critical to these horses. Keep them happy. Only certain way to diagnose gastric ulcers is you got to scope them. you got to scope them. 400 bucks, pay it. Control uh, of gastric ulcers, judicious use of products, and management. Let that horse chew. Decrease his stress whenever you can. Impaction is not limited to feeding on the ground in sandy areas. I went out there and turned the horse loose on that grass right now, and he ate that grass, he's going to pull the whole root up. What's on clinging to that root? Oh, wait a minute, dirt and sand. Okay. So, now we're going to flip real quick. Uh, Shakespeare, Richard III, in 1594, one of these quotes was, A horse, a horse, my kingdom for a horse. We all have heard, no foot, no horse. And that's true. Cripple horses don't make great athletes. So, here's our goal. We're not going to talk about training and shoeing. I don't care whether you like a barefoot, whether you like aluminum shoes, glue on shoes, magic shoes, dancing shoes, I don't care. I'm not going to talk about that. We're going to talk about normal hoof growth and physiology, what nutrients are required, and ingredients that you want to look for. The horse literally, literally, and I have to be really careful when I show, I'm not even show you. The horse runs on his middle fingernail. Now you can envision his middle fingernail, okay? When he started out, he was a little bitty guy about like that. He had uh, four toes, now we have three. So what happened to these, these bones right here as he went from murky hippus to plow hippus? Where did they go? They're called split bones, right? The split bones up at the top part of the cannon bone. That is where these are. So they didn't go away, they just kind of got, got a little bit smaller and shorter. Causes of poor hoof growth and quality, age. Believe it or not, as we get older, some things don't work as well. Genetics. Some horses genetically have crappy feet. And they're going to have crappy feet, I don't care what you do with them. But let's get them the best crappy feet they can have. As John going to say, I don't care because you've got crappy feet. Environmental. Management and nutrition. So, this is the great start nightmare I talked about yesterday. How we feed the hoof? You got to feed the horse. No one is smart enough to come up with a hoof supplement that has biotin, methionine, zinc, copper, whatever else in it, and he goes, okay, today, biotin, you're to go to the foot. Biotin's not going to go there unless everything else is taken care of. When a horse eats, the first thing he has to do is maintain himself. He can't grow unless he maintains himself. He can't work unless he's maintaining himself. So if I've got a horse that's a body condition score of two, and I feed him a hoof supplement, it ain't going to his feet. He's worried about living until tomorrow. He's got to feed the horse. So, let's do a little bit of investigation when we get to talking about right should I do supplementation. And I'll help people do this, and, and all it is is a rhythmic thing. So, what do you feed? How much water, energy, protein, minerals, and vitamins? Just, just a rhythmic thing. Easy to do. Average horse will consume 8 to 10 gallons a day for maintenance. This can easily go up to 40 gallons in hot weather, hard work. 80% of the hoof moisture is supplied internally. And that other 20% comes through the hoof, the sole, not the hoof wall. I'll show you something on that in a minute. Hoof wall moisture can be as high as 50% based on some, some data out of Australia. That's pretty optimistic. <clears throat> energy, we get energy from carbohydrates, starches, and sugars. We get them from fats and oils, which are essential fatty acids. There's two, metal and metal lytic. Omega-6, omega-3. Omega-3 is anti-inflammatory, omega-6 is pro-inflammatory. Corn oil is really, really high in omega-6 fatty acids. It causes inflammation. There's these cool things called ceramides, and ceramides come from specific oils. 
And, and ceramides are, I've, I've been to Japan five times lately, and believe it or not, they can understand my accent because they have a translator that understands my accent and they translate. Anyway, the, the ladies over there use a lot of cosmetics that have ceramides in them. But what they do is they decrease moisture loss from the skin and from the hook wall. So now I kind of got to where I get to looking for things and I go, see this right here? Ceramides? Ceramides are pretty cool. I, you start now to see them advertised on things in the U.S. A lot of products in the U.S. for, for ladies. Energy effect, energy efficient stops hoof growth. So it's cold weather. You live up here, by God, where it gets cold. You have to trim your horse a lot in the wintertime? No. Hook, walk, hook growth up here almost stopped. Decreased fatty acid intake impacts the quality of the stratum medium, which is part of this hoof wall. Sudden access to too much energy, boom, laminated cap sudden. I showed you earlier why that happens. It changes the gut microflora. Protein effect, protein quality is critical. The, uh, and this is just amino acids. We talked about uh, uh, the thionine primarily. Soybean meal is the one I want to look for. Protein addition may improve hoof quality uh, growth. Gelatin does not. I remember when everybody used to do, I'm going to feed not together. <laughs> Methionine is a sulfur amino acid that's critical for hoof growth and fingernails and everything else. And since it's not in gelatin, don't feed your horses gelatin. Things going to do a gap burning thing for the foot. It's a waste of your time. Methionine is a self-contained amino acid. <clears throat> Cysteine is a self-contained amino acid formed from methionine. Thiotin is a self-contained B vitamin. This one gives us something called a disulfide bond that gives us strength in that hoof wall. This one, thiotin, gives us something called a sulfhydryl bond that gives us flexibility in the hoof wall, and more importantly, in the frog. Mineral effect, low zinc and copper intake it increases white line disease. We use proteinated copper, zinc, and manganese, increases hoof growth by 4%. This is uh, Dr. Ed, uh, Johnson, Dr. Ed in Florida. Brittle feet respond to calcium plus protein rather than biotin alone. Well, biotin is not the magic bullet. Chronic excess of uh, dietary selenium will tie up sulfur, and in uh, severe cases, the hoof falls off. You live up here. You have a slight selenium deficiency. So everybody is, uh, I got 10 minutes. <laughs> now you're making me go fast, and I can't do fast in my head. Anyway, we have a selenium deficiency up here. I looked at four things in there yesterday that should have had selenium in it, and supplements, and everyone had selenium. Everybody had selenium, don't worry, but you're not going to get a selenium deficiency. Plus, you get hated, it doesn't come from up here. You get hated, it comes from out here, down here, over there. Yeah. So then talks about I'm more concerned with that in the deficiency. Best soluble vitamins, A, D, and E, water soluble, biotin. So if you feed a lot of biotin, and it's not utilized, it makes really expensive urine. Okay? Like this hundred milligrams of biotin? Hey, no horse alive and use a hundred milligrams of biotin. I see something with a hundred milligrams of biotin. About 20 to 25 is the most you need to think about. Biotin, and I'm going to flip through these pretty quick. This is just data to show the range of what we really can feed as far as biotin. This is 15 thoroughbreds, uh, 30 milligrams to uh, 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 draft horses, five months, took a long time. Thicker and harder hoof horn, hoof wall. After an additional four months, shooting was easier. This is made for data. This is the one that every company that has a supplement to refer to as the Lipitor Stagon. 20 milligrams a day, the horse will go three years old, took six months to see a difference, nine months to see a significant difference over a year in some horses. No difference in growth rate. We saw a little difference in quality. So if you're going to use a hoof product, you got to plan on feeding it for a while. You feed it for 30 days, you know, it don't work. It ain't supposed to work. It takes a year for that hoof to grow out. That guy got a jet car. Wow, my grandson would be. This is uh, zero, seven and a half milligrams, 15 milligrams a day, 15 milligrams for an alternate month. All treatments improve growth and hardness. Best was 15 milligrams a day. Well, the last one was 20 milligrams. 
How much is the horse now? Did you get over about that 20, 25? He's going to urinate. Uh, this right here really came down to about 20 milligrams for an 1,100 pound horse, 8 to 15 months. You see a difference. As soon as they quit feeding, they went their horse reverted. So I told you on these horses, it didn't make a difference. This one had almost 100 horses. Most of these others had 6, 8, 10 horses. Really low numbers. This is an interesting study. This, this is Hampton's work out of Australia. He's with Chris Pollitt's group, who I think is one of the best groups in the world on laminated episodes and laminated issues. So he did a study <clears throat> where he took the bromies, and some of them were in, like where I live, Spurley Drive. Some that are in Louisiana, early, Bobby, and some that are like up here, dry, wet, dry, wet. <clears throat> they went in and they measured the moisture content in the hoof wall. 29.6, 29.5, and 29.5. The environment did not change the moisture in the hoof wall. Where it does change is soil moisture. Within two hours, that horse standing wet, wet, that soil became much softer. So where I am, a lot of the old ranchers would let the water trough overflow and it helped keep those soles moist. It did not impact the hoof wall. So when you paint a hoof dressing on, you know, whatever it is, what you're really doing, you're not adding moisture back into it, you're keeping moisture from being lost. So you gotta, be, you gotta investigate what you're gonna feed. I'm going to look for lysine and methionine, and I'm going to look for biotin, and I'm going to look for the ingredients down here. That's how I'm going to pick my hoof product. Not on price, on uh, what's in there, and what is this Hanyak that gave me a little talk on feet? What did he say we should look for? So, take home message this is my baby. Hoof growth is slow, a half to three eighths of an inch per month, a year to grow that foot out. You gotta feed the whole horse. Guys, you gotta feed the balance ration. That's arithmetic. Quality of supplements can help. Remember, if a little is good, a lot is not always better. That's selenium toxicosis. Vitamin A toxicosis. Vitamin D toxicosis. You can't change genetics, but you can last allow that horse to be the very best foot that he can be. So, in my world, that's me and one of my horses. The horse I'm showing right now. That's my email. You're welcome to send an email to me anytime you want to. I won't answer you, but you can send an email. <laughs> no, I'll be happy to answer it. I have a Facebook page that is educational, strictly educational. I'm not going to tell you to use Jim's product, Jack's product, our product, anybody's product. It is strictly educational. Like uh, two days ago, the first, I put a note on there, hey, today's the first day of the month, don't get to start yourself. Just to remember it. Last month, I forgot until the second day. So please follow me there. Any quick questions? I got five minutes. Very nice presentation. Thank you. Appreciate it. <laughs> I appreciate y'all coming in this contact freezing weather. Oh, you're used to it. Yeah, I got a question. Yes. I've been told to get proper lysine injection mm -hmm. um, if you're feeding a lysine supplement. You should also feed a supplement or else they really don't get the digestion. Now, lysine is in the main, central amino acid. That horse is going to absorb that and use it in protein, uh, building protein no matter what. In fact, this is our first limit amino acid. We normally find it to, to be deficient. You'll see uh, vitamin C in some supplements. Horses don't have a, 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 a feed requirement for vitamin C. They formula it in, in, in the uh, large gut. The only thing that needs a vitamin C requirements, man, monkey, guinea pig, and uh, some snake. I don't know which one it is. Man, monkey, primary, primary. Oh, I'm missing my primary Like, you feed a lysine, but I was told that it doesn't fully absorb the vitamin C, too. Wrong. So I that's, that's incorrect. It has, vitamin C has absolutely nothing to do with getting lysine to be absorbed from that, large, that, that, that small gut. It's going to go across the cell membrane. Nothing to do with vitamin C. Absolutely not. Unless somebody's trying to sell you something that has lysine and vitamin C in it. No, it's a, they weren't selling either. Okay. But it has nothing to do with physiological, nutrition, absolutely nothing. You want to, and a lot of people will feed lysine, especially when you, when you get a little bit worried about herpes and stuff. 
there's some anecdotal information that glycine might impact herpes in horses. There's no research data to support that. Anything else? Yeah. 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 Natural and synthetic, if I want to cover we're, all we're, my bases. We were talking about vitamin E, and, and there's natural source vitamin E, and there's synthetic vitamin E. Natural source will cross the blood brain barrier, synthetic will not. That's the only difference. You get about 30% more international units per milligram of the natural source that you do the synthetic. One milligram gives you one IU of vitamin E activity in the Synthetic, one milligram will give you 1.36 IUs of vitamin E activity with the natural source. And that's of course usually costs twice as much. Do the arithmetic. I'm going to feed more of the synthetic if I need to. Now, if I've got a horse I'm worried about uh, neurological issues, EPM horses, uh, EHM horses, some of these kinds, I'm going to use the natural source. And the natural source of one to use is, is a liquid. There's two or three on the market, and they're all very good. Rob Shearer's got one, Joe Pagan's got one. With the ulcers, do they, do you cure an ulcer, or is it something once they've got them, it's there, or just is active good or question. not active? Good question. The question was, if a horse has ulcers, can you cure, cure that ulcer? We cure that ulcer by using Gastrogard or Miprazole for 28 days, and we allow that the, that, that, remember, that mucosa is turning over all the time. It's kind of like bone. Even in, in us old people, bone is changing. It's growing. It's doing something all the time. So what we do is new cells come in, and they, they we might find a little bit of scar tissue, depending on how bad it was. But then you have to come up with some reason that we don't get that ulceration to start again. It's starting to remember. Too much aggression, not enough protection. But where would you bet on that? Because gastro guard. Well, unfortunately, is a it's not my horse, and the owner's not willing to do no. that kind of stuff. So I'm trying to work with my a way to help him. I just got his teeth done yeah. by a really good oh. dentist, and I'm trying to get him. Keep yeah. him chewing. I keep think I'm going to put a slow feed. I'm just worried he's going to tear his mouth up. No, it's <laughs> But it might be better than the ulcer. Well, it's a lot better than the ulcer. <laughs> you just watch it. You know, and they've got there's some really. He's good a race. Stuff. He's an off the track guy. Oh, oh, oh he, he is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. So the number one thing I would think I would take away from this, which I already do, is just keep feeding your animals. So That's the it. stuff goes in and goes out, That's and it. they can manufacture their own nutrition exactly. on a regular basis. Or, okay. And would that help with the antiviral too? The like, antiviral? You know, back here, I, I wouldn't worry about any of this back here. No. What we're out, where I live in Arizona, and then. Over in California, if we, we do get concerned about any of this, we don't have a high magnesium or a high alpha back here. Uh, yeah, and I've got a good friend. Uh, I used to team roam before I started cutting. And my team roam partner used to say, as long as they're eating, drinking, peeing, and pooping, I don't worry too much about it. <laughs> I think he's pretty smart. <laughs> and then he finally got to where he could catch a head, and I was looking bad, so I quit team roam. <laughs> if you catch the heels, and you got a header, and he never catches the head, you never look bad. It's a stupid header. I can't believe he didn't catch a horn. Horns are sticking out there. <laughs> then he started doing that, and he's like, okay, now my healer's not catching. I quit. I'm going to catch you. You got it? Uh, well, we're going to 